What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be brewing up a Hefeweizen, but I'm going to be doing a few things differently than my usual videos. First of all, we're going to be brewing a 10 gallon batch of beer today instead of a 5 gallon batch, and that's going to turn into a splash, a split batch of two 5 gallon fermentations with two different yeasts, Imperial Stefan and Lalamad Munich Classic. Hopefully we end up with a pretty interesting difference between these two yeasts and see how they both perform. Hefeweizens really can be as simple or as complicated as you want them to be. You can make a great Hefeweizen with a single infusion mash and a simple boil, or you can make a really complicated Hefeweizen that's been decoction mashed and, you know, laudered for three hours. Uh, that's entirely possible as well. It all comes down to how much control do you want over that part of the brewing process and what kind of results are you happy with. The Germans traditionally are going to do this, the decoction mash or the step mash style, um, and it's gonna be a pretty hefty long brew day. And that's something similar to what we're trying to do today. We're gonna be doing a step mash with it, um, but not a decoction mash. A decoction mash is a little too much work right now. Um, that's something I've done in the past and I've done it one time. It was very successful, it was very interesting, um, but holy crap was that a long day and I don't think I'll be doing it again. We're gonna be brewing with a much higher percentage percentage of wheat relative to Pilsner malt and we'll be incorporating a ferulic acid rest into the first part of the mash to see if we can influence our flavor a little bit. I'm also going to be brewing this on again the 20 gallon 240 volt claw hammer system today. This is a big system. Big thank you to Kyle and Emmett for shooting that over my way. It is a solid system so do check them out if you're curious about that. Also, a big thank you to Northern Brewer for helping make this video possible. You can find everything I'll be using for ingredients on their website, as well as plenty of great equipment, great advice. Go check them out. They're no longer owned by InBev either, so that's a big plus. So now for our recipe. Keep in mind that this recipe is also for a 10-gallon batch. If you want to do a 5-gallon batch, this recipe should be fine. Just cut everything in half. We're going to be starting out with 12 pounds of Weirman white wheat malt. Normally with a Hefeweizen, I'll do a 50-50 split of wheat and Pilsner malt, but today we'll be doing something more like a almost 70-30 split. Next, we'll be adding seven pounds of Weirman floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt. This is an under-modified Pilsner malt that we can use during that step mash to really make it the best it can be. Lastly, I'll be adding half a pound of melanoidin malt to the whole thing just to add, kind of simulate a little bit of a decoction mash there. Half a pound in a 20 gallon batch isn't really gonna do too much, but maybe it'll help. For hops, this is a really simple beer when it comes to hops. It is literally just 12 to 13 IBUs at bittering at 60 minutes, that is it. Uh, there's no need for an aroma hop unless you really wanna incorporate one, but I'll be just adding 12 or 13 IBUs worth of Tetnong at the very beginning. For me, that's two ounces of Tetnong, which is 3.9% alpha acid at 60 minutes in the beginning of the boil. For water on this one, in the past, I've actually had relatively complicated water profiles for Hefeweizens. I've tried to push the maltiness. I've tried to increase the minerality and it doesn't really help all that much. So I'm gonna kind of flip that around and see what happens if I actually go with a very, very soft water profile. And by very, very soft, I mean actually not added anything to the water at all. So in the past, I've actually made some pretty good beers using just plain old untreated spring water. Uh, so that's what I'll be trying to do today to get that very soft water profile. Spring water is being chosen over RO or distilled water because even though most minerals are at a very, very low level, there's still some minerals in there. Um, and depending on where you're getting your spring water from, that can vary a little bit, but for the most part, they're usually only going to be under 10 ppm for most minerals. So we'll see what happens when I experiment with that. For the yeast on this one, I'll be doing a split batch. Again, one of these batches is going to be fermented with uh, Imperial Yeast G01 Stefan, and the other batch is going to be fermented with Lalamand Munich Classic Dry Yeast. Both of these are uh, Weiss beer yeasts, and it's possible they're both the same strain. Not totally sure what strain the Munich Classic actually is. Stefan, though, is the Weinstefan Weissen strain, the WLP 300, the uh, Weiss 3068. It's all the same strain, um, just different manufacturers. Should be interesting to see if that actually makes a difference manufacturer to manufacturer, and if it's a difference from liquid versus dry. Maybe there's a different strain there. I don't know. It should be really interesting to see what happens. For our mash schedule on this one, this is where it starts to get kind of complicated. So I'm going to be doing a step mash, but I'll be incorporating what's called a ferulic acid rest at the very beginning. This is a technique that brings out a little bit of the 4VG. This is the chemical that yeast metabolizes that's responsible for providing that clove flavor. 4-vital uh, glycol or something like that. 
that. It's a classic flavor to have, and considering the extra amount of wheat that I'm adding to this grist is actually going to create an amplified banana character, I'm kind of hoping this actually balances it out kind of nicely. So, it should be interesting to see what happens, but we'll be doing a rest at 113 Fahrenheit for 10 minutes first. Uh, and we are going to shut off the heating element during this rest because it is very easy to scorch wort at these low temperatures, especially high protein wort like this one. Uh, next, we'll step up to a beta sacrification rest at about 135 Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. And I'll accomplish this by adding in four gallons, or 25% of the water, at boiling temperatures to the actual grist. This will raise it up to 135, and we won't scorch the wort that way. Next, I'll be stepping from 135 up to 156 for another 30 minutes. This will be done through the heating element. At that point, we won't have as much of a risk of scorching, so it's okay to just use the element for that. And then from 156 up to 170 for a mash out. We'll hold that last mash out rest for 15 minutes as usual, and then we'll begin our laudering process. The important thing here with laudering is that you are including rice hulls. If you have over 50% wheat malt like I do, it's very, very important to include those rice hulls in there to increase your chances of actually having a successful lotter. If you don't include the rice hulls, you're really risking getting a stuck mash or a stuck lotter. Um, and even though I'm using a brew in a bag system or a brew in a basket system, it is entirely still possible for that wort to not drain out of the center of that and you still take an efficiency hit from it if, um, otherwise. It's a beautiful day outside. Hauled the system outside again. I'm running a power cable through the wall. So um, yeah, it's just nice to be able to do that every so often. Take advantage of the weather. Let's get to it. I added 12 gallons of spring water to the claw hammer supply 240 volt 20 gallon system and started to heat it up to the first rest temperature which was the ferulic acid rest at 113 Fahrenheit. I also milled all of my grain at this time and used my 120 volt system to start separately boiling the four gallons of water that I was going to need for my second infusion to bring it from the ferulic acid rest up to the first sacrification rest. Once the water reached the ferulic acid rest temperature of 113, I waited until my other four gallons of water started to boil. Then I turned off the 240 volt element in the main mash tun and dowed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up all those clumps. I also ensured that one pound of rice hulls was evenly distributed through all the ground up grain uh, before even doughing in in the first place. Once everything was all dowed in, I did not recirculate and I let it actually just sit there at 113 Fahrenheit for 10 minutes, and then once that 10 minutes was up, I added the four gallons of boiling water from the claw hammer 120 volt system to raise it up to the next temperature step of 135. Once I added all that boiling water, I immediately began to recirculate to evenly distribute that temperature. Since the acid rest was complete at this point, I took a pH reading and I saw a pH of 5.62. From what I understand, this is actually on target for a Hefeweizen, uh, as they do tend to finish a bit tart. So I hope to counteract that with a slightly higher mash pH. Once the mash had rested at 135 for 30 minutes, then I raised it up to the next step of 156 Fahrenheit and let it sit for 30 more minutes. Then I raised to the mash out step of 170 and let it rest for 15 minutes. Pulled out the grain basket, let that drain for 15 more minutes, and then set up the uh, controller to maintain temperature right below boiling. Before the boil, I used my Anton Par Easy Dance to record a pre-boil gravity of 1037. I set the controller to about 70% power, which is enough to maintain a good rolling boil in a 20 gallon system. And at this time I added my bittering hops, which was two ounces of tetanine. Then nothing else happened for the remainder of the 60 minute boil. I added no whirl flock, no nutrient, anything like that. And once it was finished, I then began to chill down to the pitching temperatures of 65 Fahrenheit. And I transferred five gallons of wort into each fermenter. 
I took an OG sample using my Easy Dents, and I saw an original gravity of 1043. At this point, I pitched one packet of Lalamand Munich Classic into the Anvil Bucket Fermenter, and one packet of Imperial Stefan into my Spike CO5. Unfortunately, I don't have footage of this actual yeast pitch because my camera battery decided to die in the middle of that shot, so please accept this substitute with a different Imperial yeast. So to ferment this beer, it's not really all that complicated. Usually with a Hefeweizen, it's gonna be one of two things. You're either gonna be pushing it towards the upper range of the fermentation temperature, or you're gonna bring it down to the lower side of fermentation temperature. 68 is about that middle ground where you're gonna get a balanced fermentation character. But if you go hotter, up to about 72 to 75, you'll get more banana character out of the yeast. And if you go colder, down to about 62, you'll get more clove character out of the yeast. This seems to be pretty universal, no matter what kind of Hefeweizen strain you're actually working with, so that's kind of nice. But the other thing you can do to play around with the fermentation is consider open fermentation. Uh, open fermentation is shown to increase the ester activity, the extra production of the yeast. It's gonna kick out more banana character as you ferment open. What happens is the yeast they're actually, they're, they're not inhibited by any sort of headspace pressure, no matter whether or not you actually added headspace pressure at all, it just kind of is sensitive to it. So it creates this massive Krausen to protect itself uh, from things that would fall into it or insects, that sort of thing. Uh, as it creates this Krausen, it's actually entirely sanitary to ferment it open as long as you control the conditions around it. I've done it a couple times, it does produce increased ester levels, it actually is a really nice way to uh, to kind of more traditionally make your beer. That being said, it's definitely still vulnerable, so I'm fermenting in a basement which is not really the best option for open fermentation, it's just a little too risky if you're asking me, uh, so I'm not going to actually be fermenting open, but if you do, here's a couple things to do. I would recommend placing a screen of some kind over the top of your fermenter so that bugs don't fly into it, uh, and other large debris doesn't get into it, um, and once you start to see that Krausen falling back down into the beer, take that beer, transfer it into a second vessel underneath the Krausen, because on top of the Krausen there can be contaminants, and it's something that could come back into the beer to spoil it later if, uh, if you're not careful. The open fermentation tanks that are used in most breweries that employ this traditional method are contained within basically clean rooms that are very, very tightly controlled in terms of sanitation. So if you can, you should do the same thing in your home brewery. Pitch rate in these beers, it seems, doesn't really matter all that much. You could pitch a high amount of yeast, you could pitch a lower amount of yeast, and it still seems to generate the same levels of esters and phenol. Previously, I was kind of stressing my yeast intentionally by under-pitching a little bit to try and get more yeast character, but it seems like you don't really actually need to do that in order to get a good level of yeast character out of this beer, so I'm not gonna do that this time. There's a couple alternative yeasts you can use if you wanna use, for example, Yeast 3068 uh, or WLP 300. Those are both the Vine Stefan strain. Uh, it's the same as the Imperial Stefan that I'm using, and maybe the same as the Lala Mount Munich Classic, but not totally sure. But there's a few other Hefeweizen variants out there like uh, the Hefeweizen 4 from White Labs is one example that's something that's slightly different uh, than what we are using today. Feel free to experiment around these different Hefeweizen strains, but my recommendation is really to stick with a dedicated Hefeweizen or Weiss beer yeast when you're making this kind of beer. It's a very unique character and it comes from a very unique kind of yeast. You can't sub out Kvike for it, and if you ferment it under pressure, you're gonna kind of suppress that character and it's not really meant to be uh, fermented under pressure, the yeast is very sensitive to that external pressure and might just quit on you. So, uh, just a couple things to keep in the back pocket there, but in the grand scheme of things, in a nutshell, what I will be doing is fermenting this one closed at about 72 degrees for about 10 to 12 days, however long it takes me to complete fermentation completely, and then I'll transfer into both kegs and uh, we'll force carbonate because, well, you know, time. Anyway guys, I'll see you in a few weeks. So fermentation on both batches was impressively quick. The Lalaman Munich Classic actually ripped through this beer in about three or four days and reached his final gravity a few days earlier than the Imperial Stefan did, and I think that's just due to having many more cells. That being said, I saw the same exact final gravity of 1010 on both batches, and they were both completed after only about seven days at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And even though the beer is tasting pretty good in both fermenters, I still had a condition for a few more days in the fermenters and then kegged on day 10.
So the beer is called Evergenial, and it comes in at 4.4% ABV and 13 IBUs. So with these two beers, the one that is being poured into the Weinstefan glass is the one that I fermented with Imperial Stefan. And the one that I poured into the other glass is the one that's fermented with Munich Classic. Already right off the bat, you can see that there's a huge difference in the appearance of the beers. The Stefan is pouring a hazy gold color, um, but it is definitely opaque. It has a huge rocky head on it, massive amount of head retention, which is awesome. This head legitimately sticks around for about five minutes and leaves some fantastic lacing. On the other hand, for the Munich Classic, it's almost clear. There's a slight haze to it, but it's really much, much clearer than the other beer. Same color though, a nice golden color with a uh, much less impressive head on it, which I find very interesting. It still has good head retention and a good head that builds up, but it falls much faster. Uh, both of them still do keep a good layer on the surface though. So both of these beers were fermented under the same fermentation conditions, the same temperature for the same amount of time, but one was fermented in a conical, the Stefan, and the other one was fermented in an anvil bucket, I mean a classic. And I think that might be responsible for some of the differences we're gonna experience here today. So we'll go in now for aroma, starting with the Stefan. The Stefan is really kind of a nice bready malt, character there with a little bit of a light phenol as well so it's got some cloviness to it yeah definitely a little bit more on the phenols though I'm not picking up really any fruit on the aroma mostly just that clove kind of character so now for the Munich Classic the Munich Classic is a much more estery much more estery aroma also much stronger this one has a little bit of an apple bubblegum kind of character on the aroma definitely getting some banana in there as well Banana bread kind of character. All right, moving for mouthfeel now. So starting with the Stefan. <sighs> mouthfeel on this one is exactly everything that I want out of a Hefeweizen. It is soft. The wheat makes it super soft. And it's got a medium full body. It's not really a thick body. And it's a medium full body though. It's definitely fuller than your standard beer and definitely fuller than American wheat. There's a good level of carbonation in there that keeps this thing quite lively. Um, but it has a very, very good mouthfeel to it and it's exactly on target for a Hefeweizen. That wheat makes it so soft and pillowy. Having a much higher ratio of wheat to Pilsner really does make this feel much more authentic as a Hefeweizen. So now moving toward the Munich Classic. So this one has honestly the exact same mouthfeel. Soft and pillowy, um, medium full. Same level of carbonation too that you feel and same level of softness. So really no differences there. Uh, but now we'll go in for flavor where there are some huge differences. So this right here tastes very, very much like a German Hefeweizen. This is a very phenol forward Hefeweizen. It's much, much heavier in clove than it is in banana, um, despite being fermented at 72 degrees. But what I don't get in banana, I actually get in bubblegum. Um, it's got kind of that slightly higher alcohol character than, um, than the uh, banana, which is interesting. The malt flavor in this is excellent too. I think that's definitely benefit adding that half pound of melanoidin malt in here really gives it that extra kind of depth really that it needs uh, since I didn't do it at Coction Mash. It's definitely very heavy in the phenols though. And if you're not really prepared for that, or you don't like clove kind of flavor in a beer, it's going to probably rub you the wrong way. This, when it was very young, 
had a borderline chlorophenol character, which is the Band-Aid flavor that you might get from basically fermenting a beer with chlorinated water. I use spring water, which is not chlorinated, and I don't use bleach to sanitize, so there's really no way the chlorine would have gotten into my water, so I doubted it was chlorophenol. However, Hefeweizen yeast as well as Belgian yeasts are noted for their phenolics, and the Band-Aid character is definitely a possibility from just using the yeast alone by itself. Now I am happy to say that that kind of improved over time. So it wasn't a chlorophenol because that character will never leave your beer. Um, but this, as it carbonated, as it aged, as it sat for a little bit, got so much more palatable <laughs> than it used to be. And I was happy to, to, uh, to see that. However, the reason why it's so phenolic is because I fermented it in a conical. Conical fermenters have a way of suppressing esters um, they have a way of basically encouraging the yeast not to ferment the same way as it would in a wider, shallower vessel. Traditionally, Hefeweizens are fermented in large open squares, which are much shallower than they are wide. They're also open fermented. I did not open ferment. So these two things in combination really did favor the clove character of the Hefeweizen over the banana character. It does make a huge difference, despite that very high fermentation temperature of in the low 70s. There's also a slight tang of sulfur in this one as well. It's definitely noticeable. Um, I wouldn't say it's bad. It's actually something that I've tasted in plenty of traditional German Hefeweizens. But it just, I just wanted to point that out though because it's not present in this one. And that's kind of a good segue for us to move over to the Munich Classic and talk about how this one's so much different. So, oh yeah, right off the bat, much, much more estery. So there's no heavy clove in this. It's, it's got some, like it's a small amount, um, but it's really vastly ester dominated. This one has none of the sulfur. This one has a far more complex ester profile to it. So you're getting a lot of banana and apple, and I'm also getting uh, a little bit of bubble gum as well. But the really interesting note that was definitely not present in this half of ice, and that makes this kind of feel a little bit more sweeter and more balanced is uh, actually a little bit of vanilla. Um, there is a vanilla character that is coming out of this that's definitely noticeable and definitely not unwelcome. Um, I'm pretty happy with it. Now the maltiness in this is a little bit more pronounced than the maltiness in this. I think that might be because that, that yeast is kind of getting out of the way. It's kind of clarifying a little bit. I'm getting kind of a false honey character out of this uh, that I'm not getting out of this. It appears a little bit more sweet, feels a bit more sweet because of that vanilla that's layered on top of everything. And I think that causes that Pils malt to really come through in a slightly sweet way. So of the two beers, I would say that this is a far more German feeling one. The way that Imperial Stefan fermented it is very much in line with my experiences with uh, Weiss 3068, the actual Wein Stefan Weizen strain that I've used all the time in other Weiss beers. Um, this one, however, the Munich Classic, is a far more Americanized Hefeweizen, I feel. It's much more banana, much more fruit. Um, there's a little bit of like a citrus character in there as well that's coming through now. And it makes for a very different, but also pleasant experience. Of the two, which is my favorite, I think I'm gonna have to go with the Munich Classic. It's a much more balanced flavor. It makes it a bit easier to drink. But the real question is, what is it gonna be like if I mix the two of them? So now, do we possibly have the best of both worlds? Mm. I think the answer is yes, it is the best of both worlds. Sometimes blending two beers gets you the perfect one. This is now a very balanced Hefeweizen and it has just as much banana and ester character as it does clove phenol. It makes for a very authentic feeling Hefeweizen. This right here tastes like a Franziskaner, like straight from the bottle. This is awesome. It also removes a little bit of sulfur tang that I got off of the uh, first beer. So when it comes down to it, what are the potential improvements that I have for this beer? Well, it's kind of hard to say because I like both yeasts and I do like what both of them do. I think the step mash worked very, very well, but I think if I had omitted the ferulic acid rest, we would see a lot less clove character in this. And as a result, the Imperial Stefan fermented beer may have been more balanced and palatable if that was the case. 
So if you're fermenting with a liquid strain like that one, I'd recommend maybe nixing that ferulic acid rest if you don't like clove. However, if I'd used the Munich Classic yeast without a ferulic acid rest, would it have been a banana bomb at the temperatures I fermented at? Probably would have. So I would say that's probably the main variable that we're gonna wanna play with is the ferulic acid rest, but also fermentation. Are you gonna be fermenting this in a conical or in a bucket fermenter, or do you have the capacity to open ferment? If so, I'd recommend open fermentation. It's much more authentic and it gets you more of that Hefeweizen character. It's kind of hard to suggest improvements on this recipe because there are so many different directions you can take it. And obviously it's also a split batch and there's some differences between the two of them. However, for my own personal tastes and what I want out of a Hefeweizen, this is what I would do. I would keep the grist exactly as it was and if not, maybe even add a little bit more wheat. Um, I love the way that the extra wheat brings out so much more mouthfeel and body. This is exactly everything I thought of when it came to the mouthfeel of a Hefeweizen. Also that amazing head and head retention on the beer is due to that high percentage of wheat. So I would keep that in there. I would probably nix the ferulic acid rest and I'd probably keep the other two steps of the step mash in there though. And then I'd probably actually ferment with the Imperial Stefan. That being said, if you wanted a banana forward Hefeweizen, then follow all those steps and add Munich Classic instead of the Imperial Stefan to get you that result. Either way, I'm very happy with the results of this experiment. It was a ton of fun to conduct, and I hope you guys actually enjoyed it and learned something from it. If you did, please comment down below. Please let me know what your thoughts are on it. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. It makes a big difference to me. If you want to support the channel, feel free to pick up a t-shirt from the merchandise store. I got a bunch of stuff down there. But if that's not your thing, there's also a Patreon. There's an Amazon store. There is a channel membership option. And there's also the super thanks button if you do feel inclined to hit any of those. Please check them out uh, if you want to help support me. It means a lot to me. And if you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also available on not only Instagram, but also Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check that out for more frequent content. So if you're still watching, big thank you to you. Big shout out to you. Anyway, guys, I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, Prost!